Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's my proud privilege to be moderating this session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in front of you, you have two individuals sitting. One is the author, the other is his close friend. Two of the most important personalities of Bangladesh's history, particularly of our liberation war. Now, we have all uh, sort of been familiar with Raman Saban's writing. We know him as an economist, as a patriot, freedom fighter, uh, conscience keeper in many ways. But the beauty of this memoir is to get to know him as a person. You would never have imagined that he was a precocious child who bit the hand of his first kindergarten teacher, kicked, kicked his first huzur, who was supposed to teach him the Quran. <laughs> and in school, he was a boxer. He got a medal in the junior school as a boxing champion. He went into, he went into um, uh, long distance running, and um, uh, he even dabbled in tennis, where one of his partner was nobody else than Ramathan, Ramanathan Krishnan who became, I think, a Wimbledon champion at some stage. And in his first encounter with Raman Subhan, Raman Subhan is defeated by him. And then Raman Subhan has the cheek to say that I actually launched him in his career because if I had defeated him, he would have never gone to become such a famous player. <laughs> he spent his uh, uh, most formative years in the, in the school, in, in a boarding school, St. Paul's between 1942 and 49, 1942 and 50, when there was a world war being fought, India was partitioned, and he spent, unlike other colleagues of his, reading the statesman, but alas, only the sports page. <laughs> <laughs> this is the side, I mean, the, the view of Ramans, what we would have never have got. The memoir is a beautifully written book, so easy to read, unlike many of Sir's article on economics, I must add. <laughs> so here we are with the man, his ideas, his life, and the story he has to tell. Now, Sir, um, one of the most powerful part of this book is his preface. And um, let me just read a part of it, which actually uh, intrigues you to go, go on. He said that, uh, I had decided to work only in, uh, no, sorry, this is not it. That, no, the why he decides to be in Dhaka, he makes it, that I thus chose to make my home in Dhaka, not out of any compulsions of circumstances, birth or ancestral inheritance, but as an ideological decision to proclaim myself as a Bengali. Sir, why did you decide to proclaim yourself as a Bengali? Ah, well, it's not an easy question. I think uh, this was a decision I took when I was at Cambridge, where I moved into the political and politicized phase of my life. And at that time, I found that uh, as a Pakistani, uh, when we were campaigning for democracy in Pakistan, uh, the natural constituency with which I could easily identify was uh, uh, the then East Pakistan. It was the Bengalis who were at the vanguard of the democratic movement. Uh, they had won the famous 1954 election through the Jukto Front, which had then been usurped by the declaration of Section 92A. And so therefore, for any engagement with the politics of Pakistan, one wanted to identify with the area where I would feel most comfortable. And of course, uh, Bangla East Bengal, now Bangladesh, in fact, appeared the natural place for me to go. It was not that I was unrelated to Bengal. I had a family connection to it, but not 
of the right political antecedents. And my father was a Bengali, though he was from West Bengal. Uh, but Bangladesh became my natural home. Kamal was already based over there. That was his home. And this was the place I thought I would fulfill whatever political aspirations I might have. Another paragraph from his uh, preface, he says, the central theme of my story is intended to, ex intended to explain why and how, under what circumstances, the great grandson of Noab Asanullah, the son of a police officer who was once contemporary of Field Marshal Ayub Khan in Sandhurst, would, on 27th March, have his home in Dhaka invaded by an officer of his troops from Pakistan Army with orders to take him into custody on charges of high treason to the state of Pakistan. Now, sir, you enlightened us a bit, Dr. Kamal Hussain, you have been his lifelong friend, his transition from, you know, the tranquil and, and, and uh, in a way, uh, sort of happy-go-lucky young man who becomes uh, the enemy of the state of Pakistan. You made the first point about his choices. The sentence I picked out from page 28 was, the subsequent story of my life will elaborate on this journey I made from my family inheritance to a life shaped through my own choices. Now, this is a point you've also noted that how from a British product of a British public school during the British period, with boxing and the marathon running and so on, to the next stage which was in the Chiefs College on, in Lahore to Cambridge. From that to emerge in 61, as the person says, Pakistan has two economies. To have Ayub Khan on the next day say, no, Pakistan has one economy. So the whole debate then is, are you field marshal Ayub Khan on one side? And in 1961, a young teacher in Dhaka University sharing the headlines. So that shows how his sensitivity to what he saw and the judgment that he could make. Basically, he has been on the side of justice all his life as I've known him, his conscious life as a teacher onwards. This brings us to, sir, your life in Dhaka University, which you say were the most formative years of your life. Would you like to share it with us? What made it so formative? Well, I think uh, Dhaka University was, you may say, the crucible for creating a political consciousness. Uh, you had a, a committed group of teachers, not all were committed in that sense. They were, many of them, just academics uh, moving ahead professionally. But there was a core of very committed people with whom I could identify and relate. The primary issue of the day, the moment I entered Dhaka University in October of 57, was the whole issue of the deprivation of the Bengalis by a Pakistani ruling elite. And all the conversations in the teachers' common room uh, were there. These were the questions which my students were also asking me in class. So it was inevitable that anyone who was a thinking person with, you may say, sort of rather raised political consciousness would really get involved in it. And since I already had a political perspective which brought me to the then East, uh, East Bengal, and once I entered it into the university, this automatically became a common experience of my life. So I can think of not a single day uh, in my entire career at Dhaka University, where in some way or the other, the issue of the state of the Bengalis vis-a-vis -vis the oppression of the Pakistani state was not really coming into the conversation. Uh, here, uh, there's a very interesting chapter uh, that I'm referring to, and that's my next question. Uh, Professor Amasman says, from, a, from political economy to politician economist, that was his transition. So would you like to tell us about that? Oh, yes. Well, it's an interesting uh, play on words. 
political economy for those who are students of economics uh, is a discipline in the economics profession which really brings about an interface of the role of politics in influencing economic decisions and that was always the theme of my economics. I was never a pure economist. But as I became more and more engaged in the uh, nationalist movement and we were interacting with our Pakistani colleagues uh, at uh, conferences and in the meetings of the panel of economists, I had by then become much more overtly involved in the political process. I was interacting with Bandhu, with the political leaders at that time. And the positions one was taking up then were really derived from the political debates which were going on. So I think it was at a meeting of the panel of economists on the fourth plan, uh, when this was in uh, 1970, when the whole issue of uh, six points and the political debate was at its high point. That, and I was, I was very aggressive in my arguments. I, I think uh, people, from, I hope, think I'm now a very mild-tempered person. Uh, but uh, for those who may remember me, it would be Kamal on the one hand and Mehfuz as my student on the other. I was a very aggressive guy in those days. And when I got into my aggressive mode in a small, conference room, uh, everyone felt that I was there. So, uh, one, of the, feel you are there. <laughs> one of the <laughs> Pakistani uh, economists, I forget his name, got very agitated and said, you are not anymore a economist engaged in political economy, you have become a politician economist. And I thought, my goodness, that is the greatest compliment anyone has made to me. Uh, and uh, that was basically the, he had captured the transition I had made. Otherwise, I was bothered that no one would think that I was politically engaged. <laughs> Going slightly behind in time, uh, and I saw in your memoir that when, you see, in Cambridge, where he uh, did his, uh, he studied after his uh, college in HSN in Lahore, uh, there was an institution which was called the Majlish. Majlish was, as he says in his book, a 19th century institution of subcontinental students in Cambridge. It was a platform for them, they would come together. So, I forget the year, sir, but the one particular year, you were the president of Cambridge Majlish, right. and Kamal, sir, you were the president of Oxford Majlish. Now, sir, imagine, take a breath. Two of our compatriots were the chiefs. So, would you like to share a little thought about your budget? Before statement? Kamal comes in, I will mention that occasion. You see, since I had a dual interest in both sports and uh, debates, uh, I told Kamal that we will have two components to that. One will be a debate, <coughs> and the theme of that was this house fears China. And the other was a hockey match between the Cambridge Majlis and the Oxford Majlis. I, was, I used to play hockey for my college. And so I turned up, along with some rather hefty looking uh, 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 people from the Majlis team, who were more sportsmen than others. One was, in fact, a test player for Pakistan, as well, Swaranjit Singh. And of course, when they arrived and they stepped out of a small sports car, the general secretary of the Majlis was a great scholarly historian by the name of Borun De. And he took one look at these people and said, Oi Baba, and he then had this match cancelled, much to the irritation of the people who I bought with me. But then we of course went on to have this debate and Kamal may want to take over from there. Yes. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned the hockey match. Because, because Cambridge had a lot of people who had got in on the basis of their sports abilities and, and these were hockey players, More, many of them from the West Pakistan. Now we unknowingly were ex made to accept this thing, we'll have a friendly hockey match. So Burun and I took one look at what got down from the car 
I mean, they all got down with their hockey sticks, jumping up and down. So he looked around, he said, we have nothing that can possibly face this. So please, Burun, go and cancel it. Discretion is the better part of valor. So that, that, that is very well rec recounted. On the debating side, this was a suggestion, this house fears China. Now, the year was, which was the year? 1955. 55, right. Now, you see how early this was in, in those days. And on our side, we speakers were Rahman, myself, Professor Murshid, my cousin. And on the other side was Omarto and who was supporting Omarto? Sadek al Sadek al just right. uh, He became former uh, Prime, Prime Minister of Sudan. Sudan. So, as Rahman writes in the book, an So, it's interesting to see that how this debate went, because in the House, this was a very lively debate, but the motion was defeated. This House does not fear China. So it's interesting how you reflect in 55 the views of young people from this part of the world and the outcomes. But it is a debate which, which is worth recounting, especially because given the, the, the different types of speakers who came and different arguments, I wish we could also capture some of those arguments on each side. How, how did it come about? That you two were the presidents of two majlishes from Oxford and Cambridge. In the same year, yes, but I mean, these are curious coincidences. <laughs> <laughs> well, I doubt that. It must no, have been no complicity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't mean that also. <laughs> no, but um, sir, in your memoir, you, um, you say that basically your political uh, orientations began in Cambridge. And particularly, you're moving towards left, which was uh, because of your intimacy with Arif uh, Nizami and he being uh, no, if, if, oh, Arif who's Mia Iftikhar's son. Uh, and so, would you like to share a few thoughts on that? Well, it was, I mean, uh, I, there was a certain natural intellectual evolution which took place from the magazines you read, from the books you read, and then. What you read and the thoughts you develop also influence the company you keep. So Iftikhar, Arif Iftikhar was the son of uh, probably the biggest landlord in the Punjab, but who was also, in fact, one of the few left politicians in Punjab politics and who owned the Pakistan Times. It was the great intellectual and left-wing daily of the day. And so we were the only Pakistanis who spoke out in criticism of the then government and all its uh, maneuverings which were going on. And we were very critical of Pakistan's uh, association with the Western uh, strategic pacts like the Baghdad Pact and the South Asia Treaty Organization, uh, Seattle. And of course, I became very friendly with Omar Hussain, who had come as part of the left tradition of presidency college and was very well read in uh, Marxist literature. And so we became a sort of natural community of people who argued together. In fact, uh, we all, when I was president of the Majlis, we organized a debate with the University Conservative Club, uh, I've mentioned this, on the theme of this house rejects Seattle. And, uh, Omar Sen, myself, and uh, Arif Iftikhar took on the conservatives from Cambridge. And I would like to think we gave them a good thrashing. Of course, this is not an objective opinion. Uh, but one of the results of that was that one of the people who debated against us, Harvey Stockwin, became a very famous journalist on the Asia circuit who began his career in Dhaka. And I have written about his turning up in Dhaka, and we went along to the foundation meeting of the National Awami Party at the Roop Mahal cinema, and we were in the Maidan when we were being stoned uh, by the, when we, not us, but the dais of Maulana Bhashadi and the leaders was being pelted with rocks, and Stockwin was wanting to take photographs of this and almost got hit by this stone, so I had to drag him away. Well, uh, from Cambridge, uh, uh, Professor Rahman Subhan <coughs> decides to come to Dhaka. This is uh, 1957, right? And so, <clears throat> uh, you know, already 
quite political conscious and decides to come to Dhaka. But uh, he is linked with the Nawab family, so he lives with uh, Khaja Nazimuddin, right, exactly. in his house. So, sir, um, by 57, Muslim League was already sort of drowned. So, the, and coming with your political sort of inclination and being the person you are, living in the house of the person who is quite discredited, can you tell us the family situation at that time? Well, the story I mentioned actually is in a way different. He had lived for, uh, after he was chief minister, in Bengal and when Jinnah died he became the governor general of Pakistan. So he left Dhaka in 1948 and he returned in 1957. One of the things I mentioned is that whilst he came from a very privileged background and it held positions of prime minister and governor general, he did not actually own a house in Dhaka. He was living with his, in his brother's house. But the real story I tell here is that when he came back, the Awami League was in power, and he decided to... This is the government of Atar Rahman. Atar Rahman. To, in fact, in which your father was, he was a member of the Sorabati cabinet. Yes, in Senate. That's right. But Khaja Nazimuddin decided to uh, mend fences with them, and he invited Atar Rahman, the chief minister, and Bongabandhu, who was then the minister for commerce, labor, and industries, to come and have dinner with him. And they treated him with great respect. They arrived formally clad in white shirvanis uh, to his dinner. It was just a very intimate dinner. What year was this? This was in, uh, it would have been in the summer of 1957. And they treated him with great respect and um, uh, told him that anything that we can do to help you to settle down in your own home uh, we will be happy to do. And this was the political culture of that time. And I follow up that story by then reporting, uh, this was the first time I had actually met Bangabandhu, that a few uh, months or so later, when the foundation meeting of the National Awami Party was taking place, this Mia Iftakharuddin had come to attend the meeting when he was attacked by A.R. Yusuf's and uh, Chhatro League uh, students and received a lati on his knee. So he was in fact uh, resting in the Shahbar Hotel. So since he was the father of my Cambridge friend, I had gone to call on him. And who should arrive over there but Bangabandhu? And Bangabandhu then came in saying, Mia Sahab, how is it possible that you can come to my town and this can happen to you? Uh, now, of course, uh, since some of his uh, students were involved in this, this was Bangabandhu uh, indulging in a bit of sort of theater. theater. But <laughs> the relevant point is that he actually came to meet him because Mia Iftikharuddin had been his political colleague in the uh, struggles leading up to the emergence of NAN, and he respected him. And so he would interact with his political opponents, whoever they were, and kept up a civilized relationship with them through this. But when he saw me there, I remember he was very surprised because last he'd seen me with the right-wing political leader, and here was I sitting with uh, the most left-wing of the political leaders. So he sort of wanted to know what exactly was going on over here. And the remarkable thing about Bangabandhu is when I met him again, uh, as I had been meeting him off and on, but when we joined the planning commission, when he invited us, he reminded me of our first meeting with Khaja Nazimuddin. And he remembered that incident. Well, Bangabandhu was always very, very famous for his uh, clear memory of events and things like that. Sir, um, <clears throat> you know, um, those of you, and I'm sure all of you will read the book, the, he's coming back to Dhaka, getting into Dhaka University, 60s to 71, that period. We see uh, Rahman Subhan emerging <coughs> as an eminent economist, a strong voice for the inequalities that existed between the two provinces, and really giving, uh, you know, 
economic, sound economic arguments behind the political demands of autonomy and things like that. So from the 60s to 70s, you really uh, see him emerging as a very, very prominent voice here. And I would like to now focus our attention on that. And this uh, role gets a dramatic public exposure by his, this, uh, you know, like a word, duel of words with uh, President Ayub Khan. Uh, Raman Subhan in a seminar announces or gives his thesis of two economy of Pakistan and then the next day the journalists ask Ayub that what do you think and he said there's only one economy. So you have Raman Subhan's name on one side and president of the country on the other side and two are made to sort of juxtapose one another and I think that basically brings Raman Subhan into a public focus which perhaps he didn't enjoy before. Mm -hmm. And since then, sir, if you'd like to gradually tell us the story about your engagements with Pakistan Planning Commission, with then Mahbubul Haq, and all the other I mean, people you've met of the Pakistan establishment, and gradually gave very solid economic arguments for the demands which ultimately led to six point in 1965. We'll get to gradually, you know, your yeah. challenge of disparity yeah. in 1960. Uh, 61. Yeah. Well, six, so points was, six points was 1966. Yeah. And Ramayana, yes. this thing which came out in the then Observer and then came out as a pamphlet, The Challenge of Disparity, 1961. So this transition from 61 to 66. Well, Kamal was part of that story. I'll hand it over to him in a minute. But I think the relevant point which uh, you should keep in mind over here is that when I had that confrontation, I was 26 years old. I'm sure you, some of you have children who are 26 years old. I have. <laughs> right. And uh, I was just a senior lecturer in Harvard University. Now why people like us got prominence at that time was that this was martial law. And all politicians had been gagged at that time. So the people who could have spoken out on these issues were not really given any space. So academics, when they spoke, could in fact get a hearing. Uh, when I first made a public presentation on this in a conference in Lahore, after this encounter with IU at a conference, the article which I presented was a very academic article on two economies. But the Pakistan Observer, the next day and the day after, gave it banner headlines and published it as in full as front page stories. When I was making my presentation in Lahore, the judge who was the chairing it, he was a, of the judge of the West Pakistan High Court, called my friend and said, who is this young man? Does he not know that this country is under martial law? Uh, now, the main point is that anyone who is speaking up for the cause of the then uh, Bengalis would get a hearing in the press. And we were filling a vacuum which would normally have been filled by the political leaders. So at a very <coughs> young age, those of the academics who were willing to be heard in public, not all academics want to be heard in public, they are happy to speak <coughs> in seminars. That remains even to be said. And uh, this gave me a degree of publicity, which I probably did not deserve, because I was, who was I? I was nobody. I was just a young teacher. But uh, once you get that visibility, then leaders seek you out. So Bongo Bandhu sought me out in 1964 to sit with Kamal and help him to prepare the manifesto for the Awami League in the 1964 election. At that time, I was uh, not yet 30, and Kamal was two years younger than me at that time, but we were the people. We used to run seminars for the uh, opposition members of parliament before they went to the uh, National Assembly uh, on what issues they should raise, we gave Abdul Haq and Muntagim Chaudhary a series of questions. We gave them briefings on the bills which were being passed. So it was very interesting that they would come to these young people and were happy to listen to us. And of course, <coughs> Kamal will tell you about our political engagements when we started uh, NASEP and things like that. And you see, the two 
sets of people who were drawn together. One were the young academics in Dhaka University, and therefore Dhaka University has a very historic role in generating nationalist, our nationalism. The other were young journalists, you know, people who were uh, in the different newspapers, K.G. Mustafa, Muhyiddin Hassan, we gravitated towards each other because in the press they were picking up these points mm -hmm. and projecting these issues, which was to define the politics of the 60s. And I think the best part of this book is it's captured, and you've just said, 61 to <coughs> 71. That to me is an absolutely glorious period of how it brought everyone together. The ideas were generated, the press people picked up this, uh, this challenge of disparity. It came out that in, the, in the middle pages of, of the Observer. From that they said, no, now let's make a pamphlet of it. So 61, this pamphleteering started. And so you had a very powerful combination. The intellectual input from the university and the pen of the journalist, of the, of the socially conscious journalist, politically conscious journalist. And that is what created the whole national movement. I strongly recommend that the books, this chap, this part of the book really gives us a, um, a very valuable insight is to the intellectual and political developments of that very crucial de uh, decade that ultimately uh, led us to our liberation war. And now I would like to sort of come to the very crucial event in both of your lives, the writing of the Awami League election manifesto of 1970. Now, um, sir, in your book you say that uh, both of you wrote it in consultation with Tajuddin. Would you like to share your experiences of that time. I think that's very exciting. No, that again is what is interesting is how intellectuals, professionals and full-time political leaders all came together. This is the most interesting part of the 60s. You had the coming together of academics, professionals and politicians and none felt that this is only for politicians. Some academics, sir. No. Yes, no, no. So, but, I mean, as a class, as a, from that group, the politically conscious and politically aware, and what I said, pro people, pro people academics, pro people journalists, and pro people politicians. Yes, because there was the other kind of politician also. So, the pro people elements would come together in a very mutually reinforcing that they reinforced each other, gave strength to each other. And the combination of this, you know, projected the vision which roused all of the people. I mean, it's a very extraordinary history, you know. I mean, I think from this book, others may feel encouraged to see how the 60s is, is a particular period where this interaction of different elements within society can create the force for change. But come on, I think what we need to emphasize over here is that critical to this relationship is the attitude of the political leaders. <laughs> and Bongo Bandhu was quite remarkable because here he was the unchallenged leader of 70 million people. But he always reached out to intellectuals and professionals to fill in gaps in his knowledge and his understanding of problems. He had a great humility. He had no notion ki hum sab janta hai. Uh, he actually sought knowledge as a resource for himself when he was engaged in his political campaigning. And so he read what we wrote. He argued with us some of the most outstanding discussions I've had on developmental issues. And, and constitutional issues have been with Bongo Bongo and Tatuddin. And my political education came through that process, that they would tell you what was possible, what was not possible. Now, the, in the making of the manifesto, what should also be pointed out is that we then decided to bring in Professor Nurul Islam, Anis Rahman. Now, Nurul Islam was then uh, the senior economist amongst us, he was heading the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, which was a government-funded institution in Karachi. But we could go there and he could get the whole Bengali team, A.R. Khan, Swadesh Bose, 
to sit with us in a government office for all practical purposes, where we then drafted this very radical manifesto. Of course, naturally, uh, this put us all under the scrutiny of the Pakistan Intelligence Agency, but it was remarkable that even people who were in public institutions were willing to put their jobs at risk to in fact participate in this area of political activism. And of course, this naturally brought us uh, into very intimate association with Bangabandhu and the Awami League leadership, as I write about it in the post-election period and the involvement in the events of March 1971, uh, which was all a sequential relationship that each step we took led to the next step. So once you get to the liberation war, what you must appreciate is that there is a whole prehistory to the liberation Continuity struggle. Of That's right. And each step in this great war which culminated in our liberation took place step by step. It wasn't just an event which took place in 1971. So uh, then we come to the event that really launches uh, Professor Rahman Subhan to a new life altogether. The crackdown on the night of the 25th of March, the genocide begins, and so it is on the 30th that you start. So uh, uh, he's warned that his house will be raided, and lo and behold, it was just the day after he actually left. So he leaves for basically crossing the border into India, and then subsequently um, um, is, is a very fascinating story. He's one of the first to go India, go to India, and basically the Indian leadership at that time really didn't know who Tajidwin was. Bangabundu was in jail. Uh, the Awami League, uh, I mean Kamal Hussain himself was in jail. So the senior Awami League leaders were not known to the Indian establishment, not even Tajuddin. And there is this absolutely fascinating incidence where actually uh, Professor Rahman Sohan <laughs> introduces Tajuddin to the Indian establishment. So would you like to share that? Well, it wasn't quite that in the sense that... Um, uh, you know by face. Yeah, that... Uh, Anisa Rahman and myself were the first to go there with the chief minister of Tripura in the I mean, who was basically taking MR Siddiqui uh, there because he was the only leader as the district president of the Awami League to turn up in Agartala. And the issue was for the Agartala administration, who were overwhelmed by all the Bangalis who were coming over the border, wanting arms, wanting shelter to get the central government of India involved. And so the chief minister then decided that he must go there. And if he was to appeal to Indira Gandhi, he must have a senior army leader, uh, league leader with him. And the only one available was M.R. Siddiqui. So when we met M.R. Siddiqui for the first time after coming across the border, and I asked him, do you know anyone in Delhi? He told me he'd never been to Delhi in his life. <laughs> So, since the only people who had kept any connection with uh, people in India were the economists, uh, and a number of our friends were in high office at that time, I offered to write him a letter of introduction since he didn't know anyone. So then he said, no, no, you come along with us. So when I went there, and uh, I went got to Delhi. to Delhi with him, and I then uh, called up Amartya Sen, then Amartya Sen, I spent the night with him, and then he took us to meet uh, Dr. Ashok Mitra, who was then an uh, economic advisor, who then eventually took me along to meet uh, P.N. Haksar, who was the uh, principal secretary to the prime minister, and reportedly the most second most powerful person in India. So the first effective briefing on at the highest levels in India, which was given to them, was given to them by Anis and myself. Uh, now, Tajuddin had also come across the border, and he was being brought across uh, and taken to Delhi, who arrived more or less the same time as we did, uh, through the courtesy of the Director General of the uh, BSF, Rustamji. 
Uh, but the problem was, when I was talking to Mr. Huxtad, that they had very little idea of who was who in the leadership of Bangla. The only person they knew of any consequence was Bongo Bangla. He was a larger than life figure who had become a global personality by that time. But everyone else uh, was in his shadow. So I then had to give them a sort of briefing on the second rank leadership. And uh, then next day, after meeting Hatsar, uh, some people came to me and said, will you come along? We want to take you somewhere. And when I went there, I suddenly found I was in a room with Mr. Tajuddin and Barrister Amirul Islam. So they knew who he was, but at the end, no one there had actually seen him. So uh, since they knew me because of my friends in high places amongst the economists, I suppose they thought that I would reaffirm that this was the person. And then Tajuddin took over as the main negotiator. And thank God that he was there at that particular moment of time, because he was the best person who had the authority to speak for us. So you, you say in your book that uh, when you became like an envoy of the government in exile of Bangladesh, and basically then got into the whole movement of that, of the liberation of Bangladesh. So would you like to share some of the activities that you did? Well, when I was with Tajuddin, we heard on the radio that uh, M. M. Ahmad, who was the great economic czar of Pakistan, was flying to America to appeal for American aid in this moment of crisis. So he was furious that they are massacring us and then they are asking for American aid. We must launch a campaign internationally to stop aid to Pakistan. And he then asked me to go as, his, as the envoy of the government, which was still not formed as yet, uh, and to initiate a campaign. Now, the, Bang oh, the Probashi Bengalis had already initiated a campaign <coughs> for Bangladesh. Everyone was mobilized. But I was the one who went out and established contact in Washington. And you had, of course, Muhid, uh, Abul Mal Muhid, Kibriya, Inayat Karim. They were a very high powered group of people who eventually, in the month of August, defected. But at that time, they were still in the mission. And they were not in a position to publicly go out and meet people. So when I arrived in Washington uh, in May, I was, in a way, one of the few public figures who could come and say that I was here speaking for now a government which was in the making. And so as a result, uh, again, who was I? I was by then only a reader in Dhaka University. And I was only then, what is it, 35 years old. But I was being hosted by senators. Uh, Senator Saxby gave a lunch for me where a dozen of the top senators, Fulbright, Church, would all come to listen to me. I could address the National Press Club, which is normally only addressed by visiting presidents and prime ministers. And I got all this visibility because an insignificant person like myself was elevated by the liberation war. As I said, the great quality of the liberation war was it could make small people appear bigger than they were because we were part of a bigger cause. Now, I suppose you live in a world where you want to make big people smaller than they are. <laughs> so then it is. <laughs> Well, sir, the um, independence movement makes every one of us brave soldiers of whatever age. But, um, you know, the memoir uh, basically ends with the birth of Bangladesh. And uh, uh, Professor Raman Suman has promised us um, a, a sequel of uh, his memoirs post-Bangladesh independence. So, sir, why do you call your memoir untronquil? Well, it's a bit of a play on words. You see, when I was uh, doing my HSC, English literature was one of my subjects, and one of my text readings was Wordsworth. And Wordsworth, uh, who was one of the Lake poets, defined poetry as emotions recollected in tranquility. So I was recollecting 
but since I was not a poet, I could only recollect it in untranquil terms. Uh, and of course, since all the life I chose and the life that Kamal chose was in a way an untranquil life, because if you want to lead a normal life, what do you do? You begin a career at the bottom, you move up the rung of opportunity, you then get to a pension stage, your children have become engineers and doctors, and you retire at home in front of the television set, living on your pension. Now here was I, I suppose, in one short life, having to leave my country at least on three or four occasions on an involuntary basis. In 71, again after the assassination of Bangabandhu, we refused to be part of the society at that time. We went off to Oxford. So life had all its ups and downs. And um, it was in that sense what I would call an untranquil life. So the recollections were untranquil. But the subtext was that these were the years of fulfillment because uh, these were great moments for us. And I quote uh, again Wordsworth. As I said, I didn't know much English literature, but I did remember my Wordsworth. And his Ode to the French Revolution, I give that as the opening quote, that uh, young, that, uh, uh, what is good you? Uh, bliss was it to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. And that was really how we actually felt. Kamandai, <laughs> let me come to you now. You have been his lifelong friend. I mean, seen him through his carefree days to his emergence as an economist, married life, and then political, political life. So you sort of take us on an overview of the book, uh, and of course your no, friendship. This is an extraordinary book for, I mean, not because I'm only his friend that I'm sort of saying this as a tribute, because the range of the book, it starts in the 30s, which is birth, and gives his early days into the British period. The whole environment in which, you know, what, what was valued was we want to be a civil servant. But the other strain which he picks up that in, in later in the book of how people began to change, how being a, a civil servant was not seen as, as the ultimate in life. And as I say, the first part is about society and excellent social history. I think there will be few things where, with such specific details, you've seen how people from one kind of background start changing the impact of education, the impact of changes in society. And so that's one aspect of the book which is very important because no one in, in a book which is historic <coughs> about history would say concentrate on political history. Or, but this has one aspect which is social history. Second part is, which I think very important, that in the Liberation War, the whole political emergence of, 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 of 71, you, you correctly framed it from 61 to 71. In fact, you could even go back to 58 or something, you know. But 61 to, I mean, you could go back to 52, but so 61 to 71 is very important to see how. You see, and, and, and he makes a very good point that. Independence doesn't come with one moment by declaration. And that is why this whole you know, debate is completely sterile. It's a whole movement I mean, where people who are subject people, we were called second class citizens. I would say we were not citizens at all in those days. I mean, there was no election from 47 to 70. So in that situation, for people to become empowered, now that is a process which is beautifully developed here. And the contributions of the different sections of the, the most conscious section. And here it was, it was heaven to be young. That is the whole role. The role of the young. How the first de defiance of martial law was the students refusing to take degrees from the appointee of the chief martial law administrator, 64. And they were all expelled. And we fought a legal battle and got all of them the degrees restored and all the students reinstated. Now this successful defiance of martial law 
is what created the spirit, sustained the spirit of Nepal. And of course, the university was critical. Now, just think of the night of 25th of March. What were the targets picked by the military? University. Of all those residents, but then immediately after that, the university. Yes. Iqbal Hall, Jagannath Hall. Picking out students, shooting them down. Picking out teachers, Professor Guha Chakurta, pulled out kids. Yes. They went to Professor Razak's house, and luckily for him, it was a little late in opening the door. All that part is very well written up. Uh, Anisur Rahman had put a lock on the outside, and therefore they thought there was no one in the house. Otherwise, we would not have these people. Now, this is where the whole process of empowerment of the seven and a half crore people of, 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 who were made up, uh, and you know, the whole thing, there was uh, Bangalis are incapable of fighting. Gee. You know, the, the, the view that they had, I mean, which proved to be so abysmally wrong, that, you know, it's a few people in the city, few teachers, few students, few lawyers, few journalists. You have a military sort of operation, few thousand may be killed, and then the rest, everyone in the villages will stand up and they're all, their view, they're all good Muslims, they will say Pakistan in the Yes. Now this was such an abysmal, I mean, mis total misconception, for which of course so many people died and, and you know, Pakistan also suffered the humiliation that it did, 16th of December was brought upon. Brought upon. Thank you. Uh, I would like to open it up to the house now for some limited number of questions. There's always a constraint of time. So, uh, I will be, will be able to entertain only a few. So, I, I suppose there's a mic around. So, please kindly raise your hand. And uh, would you introduce yourself? I'm a student of economics in the Dhaka University. Your name? I'm proud of. Name, please. Mohammed Abdul Hai yes. and a freedom fighter. Uh, I'm proud of to be the student of Dhaka University and to be a part of the freedom fighting. Uh, sir, we are always energized. We are always benefited from your uh, writings, from your books, everything. Uh, but could you please tell who are the real provocators and contributors with you to focus the disparity and inequality issues? That's mean the true economy theory. Uh, we want to know that. Okay, thank and you. Another oh. just question. Uh, after the liberation, after the independence, it is 45 years. 45 years. What do you have fight for the parent? What do you fight for the Sudar Bangla Shoshan Ke Uchukito Karatil? What do you see in present Bangladesh after 45 years, the state of economy? That means that disparity and inequality stays in Bangladesh. Thank no. you. Would well, like to answer it? Right? Yeah, I can do that. I think they were, I was never the only person amongst economists. Uh, they were quite a few. Certainly, you would want to recognize uh, Professor Noodle Islam. You would want to recognize Professor Aflakur Rehman, Professor Anisur Rehman, Professor uh, Musharraf Hussain, Professor Muzaffar Rehman. Uh, these were all people who played a very important role in giving the intellectual foundations of the issue of disparity. As far as the current issue is concerned, this is another big conversation. I think uh, uh, I have written uh, my Najmul Kadim Memorial Lecture, which was given some years ago, was titled From Two Economies to Two Societies. So I think we have, uh, I think whilst we've made very good economic development in many areas, we have become a very unequal society. I think that is the significant point. Okay. Yes, the gentleman there. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Iqbal Ahmed. I'm a researcher on child labor. Uh, my question to you, Dr. Roman, is a bit on the lighter side. Uh, earlier in this discussion, uh, in explaining why you have chose to stay in this, part, this side of the country, in Bangladesh, on this side, you have mentioned, I quote, to fulfill whatever political aspirations you may have. Did you have other aspirations, social or cultural? Well, I hope we have, all of us, many facets to our personality. Uh, but one which it strongly moved me was political. And to have an aspiration, this must be related to a particular political territory. I was no global citizen. 
and the country I could identify with was Bangladesh. My other aspirations became part of that process. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this is Shah Mohammed Fari, a former student of oh. Professor Rahman Sovan, a former teacher of Mahfuz Anam. Yes. <laughs> sir, after two serious questions, I think we need a lighter thing. Sir, could you please tell the story of you being almost killed while fleeing to India in 71? <laughs> is it a lighter story? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> well, uh, as I said, the easiest solution to that is to encourage everyone here to uh, uh, buy the book yes. <laughs> and the particular section I will point out is called Same Side Goal where as I said in if you go to see a football match in either Calcutta or Dhaka and you kick a ball into your own goal everyone shouts Same Side Goal so this was a situation in which I was uh, worried about being captured by the Pakistan army, but then almost got uh, uh, killed by the other side. And two of the people who in fact were there to identify me, uh, my student Mukhtar uh, and his uncle Mufakkar are sitting in this particular audience. Uh, so I think that is part of the narrative. Now of course, uh, the Shah Mohammed Farid is here. I wish to recognize him because he was a first class first in economics and I regarded him as one of my failures. Why did I regard him as one of my failures? Because throughout my entire teaching career, I spent my time trying to persuade my best students not to go into the civil service <laughs> and to in fact become professional economists. And uh, since he was a and virtually all the top economists of my class in the 60s actually went into the civil service and then post-liberation they got PhDs and became economists. <laughs> but that was basically one of the problems. In fact, uh, Kamal may remember that on the night before I left for Dhaka, for, for Dhaka uh, we were having dinner together and then the whole night was spent by Kamal and me persuading our cousin Kaiser Murshid not to take the civil service exam and to in fact go in to become a lawyer. And of course that too was a failure. So there are many, many failures in my ideological ventures. Okay. Uh, the organizers can kindly help me how much time I have for Q&A, at least on the official time, we have 10 minutes. minutes, yes. Good afternoon, sir. It's a great pleasure for all of us, especially the young faculty member. To, uh, this is Washim Palash, I'm a university teacher. Uh, it's a great privilege for all of us to listen to the towering personality like Rehman Subhan and Dr. Kamal Rishai. My question, at the very inception of our journey as a nation, there is a great intellectual journey, especially in economic area. The great scholar like Nurul Islam. Question, please. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Professor Nurul Islam, Rahman Subhan, Atlakur Rahman, Anisir Rahman. But after 45 years, our condition, especially in the arena of economic scholarly discussion, and a scholarly discussion in economic area is so poor. Why? Our foundation was so rich. Okay, we get, now we, we get your question. Yeah. Why is the state of economic studies so poor, having people like yourselves, so many others, as our antecedents? Well, I don't know. Uh, because they all said, went to the civil service, right? Uh, <laughs> as I said, I, I have written a lot on the economy, and so have others. So, as I said, either uh, either you may not have read it or you may have read it and found our writings are very inadequate. I cannot say what the reason for that is, but uh, quite a lot of writing has been going on and quite good research has been done. I'll take one last question. Yes, please. You know, I was just told to finish this. No, it's five. Carry on. Okay. Up to, you've okay. got another. 
another 10 minutes. Okay. My name is Sahaj Chaudhary. I'm a retired civil servant who you don't like. <laughs> Didn't persuade you either. <laughs> I was in the subsidiary economics when you were my teacher. So my question is, you were a part of the liberation government in 1971. What do you think was the major mistake made by the liberation government at that time, during nine months of struggle, or there was none? Thank you. No, actually, I was not a part of the government. I was an envoy, so most of the time, I was abroad. I only actually spent uh, one month uh, giving my report on my campaign uh, in uh, the uh, Mujib Nagar government in Theatre Road. So I would not be qualified to say what were the mistakes. I mean, those who spent nine months there would be in a better position to respond to that. I think the international campaign went remarkably well. and. I would like to certainly say that had there not been such a campaign, uh, I was looking at the conclusion of my book and at the crucial moment in the final stages of the war there was an apprehension that the Nixon government may actually intervene with the Seventh Fleet on behalf of uh, saving the uh, Pakistani forces in, uh, who were about to surrender. And the reason, I'm sure, or not completely, there were other reasons, but one of the factors was the huge campaign which went on, particularly targeting the US Congress, civil society and the media, which were all as part of this campaign, supporting the Bangladesh cause, and were very critical of the genocide which went on, and actually passed an amendment to the US aid bill the Saxby Church Amendment, which was one of the central elements of the campaign. I think uh, Mr. Muhid and others were very actively involved in that campaign, as was myself, uh, to stop it. So I think the international effort was a great achievement and a great tribute to the uh, uh, thousands of Probashi Bengalis who came together and spent nine months campaigning for the cause of Bangladesh. Now, Domestically, what were the particular problems you should ask some of your colleagues uh, who were part of the uh, Mujib Nagar government that question? Okay, next question. Uh, uh, can I, sir? Where is? Uh, I have, I'm sorry, uh, somebody at the back. Okay. I'll come to you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Mark Rook Mohyuddin. I work with UPL. Um, sir, I was just wondering, um, you made this untranquil journey, you chose to do this, and, and so did Dr. Kamal Hussain. And uh, what were some of the factors that, you know, made you embark in, the, or, or, you know, you must have seen some hope at the end of this journey, and you, you mentioned that it was fulfilling. So what were some of the factors that, you know, led you to this uh, unparalleled, you know, journey of I integrity you, you made with integrity. That's that's missing today and, and we don't see uh, a lot of people, as the other gentleman mentioned, that, you know, uh, taking up that untranquil and uncertain path and what is it that's missing today? Well, strangely enough, um, even in the darkest days, somehow we always thought there you could see, I mentioned this, you could see the top of the mountain. And as you were climbing up that mountain, you always thought that the time would come where you would reach the top. And I again give another quote, I think this time it's from Keats. Uh, uh, as when he writes about when Cortez upon a peak in Darien uh, looks down and sees the Pacific Ocean, how he felt. So that is basically how we always looked at it, and it was always a great inspiration for us. Never, and we had a whole community behind us. We were never alone in this fight. This was the great and encouraging moment, and the major political players were identified with this struggle. That's why. Uh, you never had a sense of despair, even when we went through very dark moments. Kamal would 
confirm that as well. And as a much younger person, I can share with you, it was the infectiousness of the moment. Mm, please. Uh, I'm uh, Farana Sattar. I'm a ret retired teacher and a freelance writer. Uh, so I'm honored to be in the presence of you and uh, stalwarts like you and Dr. Kamal Hussain. Uh, uh, your uh, and other economics' uh, view of the two economic theories, uh, the acknowledgement of that led to the movement of the creation of a nation. That was the solution to that problem. And as you said, that now please ask two, the question directly. Two societies, and I would like to look to the future. I mean, once you mentioned it, about two societies now, how? What is, the, how is the, what is the solution to this, to unify the, our society as one homogeneous society? That is the problem that we are facing now. And I'd like to look at solutions, not just problems. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to wait for the second volume. Uh, I pray hard that I live long enough or my mind is alive enough to write it. Well, that prayer sir, is instantly made from all of us. <laughs> Please. Yes, please. Uh, the, the, the Victor Mallet, Financial Times, you didn't quite answer the second part of the previous question, but one, and that is, you know, has the promise of those years been fulfilled today? And, and if not, uh, what, what's, if anything has gone wrong, what has gone wrong? Is it political? Is it economic? Is it both? In other words, what, what is the sort of, yeah, how, how do you feel the, the hope that you just described feeling in those years, um, has that has that hope, have those hopes been fulfilled? And if not, what's missing? Well, that is, as I said, uh, whilst I would not want to be evasive to that question, uh, this is in a way part of a much longer story. And I have, of course, been writing a lot about that in recent times, uh, that, uh, Many of the promises have been fulfilled. We have done in many areas much better than we had hoped. Uh, in other areas, there have been disappointments. We are a more divided society. We are a more socially and economically unequal society. These were all very important components of the liberation struggle and its underlying philosophy. But. To satisfactorily answer that, I mean, I wouldn't want you to wait for the second volume because actually I have a huge volume of contemporary writing on that subject, uh, which, uh, as I said, if you ever have the time or interest, I could refer you to them. So did you want to say something? Sir, so Mike. In this volume, you might find part of the answer to some of these questions. I particularly refer to this chapter, uh, this section, starting at page 331, heading People's Raj. Now, this is talking about the non cooperation movement of March 1971, before 25th of March. And there's a remarkable account here of the state power with martial law, was in, not with the people, but people were able to assert themselves. And there, someone said, Why are we disunited? Now, that's the key yeah. unity. Number two is the role of the press. And you remember that you know they, they identified those were the real sources of power. The newspapers that were shut down, Ittifaq and Shambhad. The university that was made the target of the military's tanks. So these are the answers, that the real sources of power are people. And if people are made conscious through proper journalism, why is journalism today being attacked? I mean, I, I say this with all sympathy with you. That this is because you are empowering people. And if you can be shut down, if you can be gagged, that process of empowerment can be impeded, but not ended. Bangladesh, I believe, people's power that Rahman has written about, and 71, which saw the culmination of that, was an achievement of all of the people. You don't disempower people, you empower people, you strengthen them, and the country is theirs. This is what is, I think Rahman has captured. And so the point of departure for the second volume is already there. <laughs> uh, <coughs> One or two more questions. Yes. The microphone. Hello, I am Joseph 
feminine journalist. Um, I was interested to hear that you left in 1975. Um, I mean, was that because you felt under uh, danger? Were you under threat? I mean, was, were you in danger of your life? Why, why would you? Oh, no, no, not really. I mean, I think when... Did you say 75? Yes, why I left. Well, as I said, again, uh, you will need to wait for the next volume. But I suppose the short answer to that is that the whole direction which the assassination of Bongo Bandhu and his uh, co-leaders, in fact, took, suggested this was moving towards a society which was totally abhorrent to what we had fought for. And the whole thought of being associated with that was quite intolerable. But personally, I'm not, I don't know that I was under any threat. It was just, uh, uh, as I said, not really being part of that process. OK, the last question. Yes. This is Manzur Ahmed from Brack University. Uh, the question is, are we still fighting the liberation war? Have we gone back in some ways? And can we look forward with some faith and optimism? Well, I've always been an optimist. I think uh, some of the battles are still historical battles. But the lesson of the liberation war is that you needed to create a sense of nationhood again, where in fact people could be collectively mobilized for the sort of broader, to realize the broader goals of the liberation war. And uh, since at the end of the day, I have always been, even to this stage in my life, an optimist. Um, many of my colleagues always accuse me of a certain Pollyanna approach to gratuitous optimism. Uh, I would like to think that those possibilities are still ahead. So uh, before we conclude, uh, Dr. Kamal Hussain, would you like to make an overall comment on the book? A mic, sir. No, as I said, this book is very, very valuable, not only for getting answers to the kind of questions that have come, but for anyone writing further, because there's a lot of basic facts which is recorded in great detail for each each part of the book, pre-61 pre to 71, and then of course the whole phase after uh, 25th, 26th of March, the process of uh, campaigning that was done, external campaigning, and this letter that is annexed to the last annex chair. Uh, which he, the briefing he did to someone from the State Department in Washington, and this document has now become available because it's after so 30, 40 years now they get accessible. And I just say this is a tribute to Rahman, so I read it out. The last sentence of the last page, uh, and also to the previous Rahman that I've made the whole book, <laughs> cover to cover. <laughs> And this you have skipped some pages in between. <laughs> the essence of his speech was a familiar one. Struggle will go on. Political process will become more radical. There will be never a settlement within the framework of a unified Pakistan and so on. Then he says, this analysis, when stripped of his personal biases and the rhetoric of his presentation, seems very much on the mark. This was the Under Secretary General of the State Department uh, in, in the 1970s, yeah. after his briefing. This note has come out of these files after the files have been opened up this year. So, in his last comments uh, before we close. Well, uh, thank you for all being here. It was a great adventure <coughs> writing this book. I find now that my memory of those early years, and particularly of 1971, is very vivid. I can remember it almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Unfortunately, uh, what I did last week is more difficult to remember. <laughs> so in fact, writing the second volume will be a bit more of a challenge. Uh, but as I said, it is a story. As I said, don't see this as a history of the liberation war. It was the way a person who should never, through his upbringing, have been part 
of a liberation struggle, got involved in the liberation struggle. So if anyone wants to trace the course of a unusual life, which ended up in a quite different direction from where it began, this might be an interesting story to read about it. And if nothing else, read it as a novel rather than a bit of history. <laughs> well, <clears throat> to, to encourage you all to read the book, let me say that there's some absolutely treasure of food that was available during his younger days. <laughs> and Rama Subhan's love for khiri kebab is absolutely <laughs> overwhelming. And there's this absolutely touching uh, sort of um, description of uh, uh, his uh, first meetings with uh, Salma Appa, where he says that we had ice cream. And ice cream was always a high point for me to become intimate with somebody. <laughs> It is the person, Raman Subhan, that so beautifully comes out. Um, um, well, um, I had another story with Rana Kappa, which uh, again you will be very happy to know that uh, some in some period of his life he fell in love with cha cha cha, the you know the, the dance, and we we are. Curse the book, we are made to know that even now in New York, Raman Bhai and uh, Rana Kappa goes to clubs to dance cha 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 to see how their <laughs> sense of rhythm has to survive. So I think that encapsulates uh, 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 Professor Raman Subhan's joie de vivre. He, he's an intense intellectual, he's uh, a committed patriot. He's a freedom fighter when uh, times call for, but he has uh, such a beautiful approach to life that he knows how to enjoy his life, his meals, and his cha-cha-cha and ice cream whenever chance permits. So we have here a man absolutely ep epitomizes the fullness of life. But sir, uh, let me say, uh, as your student and somebody who has had greatly admired you and followed you, that even after 71, you have remained an inspiration to all of us. Your commitment to your discipline, your economics, your patriotism, and your being with us through all the you know, turbulent times of the country post-71. You have endeared us, endeared you to a whole range of generations, mine, sub subsequent generations, and it is such a privilege to have a person of your integrity, your commitment, your you know, intellectual caliber to be with us all these times. So please accept a grateful thanks from all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here.